Welcome to our Sound for Video session. It is the 13th of October 2016. And again, this week we're doing some question and answers uh, from questions that you submitted. So let's have a look. First of all, we have one from J Daniel Schenk. Hi, Curtis. I have a question that you may have already covered when selecting a microphone for podcasting. What is the quality difference between mics that you can plug into the computer directly and mics that you need an amplifier mixer for? That depends on a lot of factors and it depends on them. Well, let me take a step back. So in my production audio course, one of the things we talk about some is the fact that um, there's a signal chain. Whenever you're recording something, there's a full signal chain. There's a microphone which captures the sound waves and actually converts them into electrical signals. Um, there's a there's a preliminary amplification stage of that signal, often at least in condenser microphones. In dynamic microphones, no. That signal is then sent to a preamplifier, which then amplifies it further up to line level. And then from there, if you're doing digital, um, like in the case when you're recording to your computer, you are then converting the somewhere in the signal chain, it's converted from analog to digital. In USB microphones, that happens in the microphone. In um, When you're recording with a recorder or audio interface or mixer, that's happening in that other device, whether that be an audio interface, usually an audio interface or the recorder. So that is the... That is how the signal chain works. Now, whether wh the quality that you get depends on a number of things. It depends on the microphone itself, and it also depends on all the cables that connect that to the analog to digital converter, which again is going to be in the recorder or the audio interface or whatever you're using. Um, and those are the, the three main things. I would say of those two things, the thing that makes the biggest difference is the microphone and the analog to digital converter. So, for example, I have a microphone, the Audio Technica ATR, no, sorry, AT2005, I think it is, and it is a dynamic microphone. It has an inbuilt analog to digital converter, so you can hook up a USB cable to the microphone, run that directly into your computer, or it also has an XLR out output, so you can connect an XLR cable and take it into an audio interface or a recorder. And what I found in my test was that when I took that one into a good quality recorder or audio interface, it actually sounded quite a bit better, which means that the inbuilt analog to digital converter inside the microphone is just sort of mediocre. So it's gonna depend on a lot of things. If you have a specific microphone that you're curious about, I would go and listen to some samples of it in as much as you can. There are some really good ones out there. Um, Blue makes some that are pretty good. I think the Yeti is a very popular one. What I would recommend is if you can, I would get one that has the option of both XLR output and USB output. That way, if you find in the future, um, maybe if you're not invested in an audio interface right now and you may want to in the future, you could potentially improve the quality of that, the you know, your overall sound once you upgrade to a good quality audio interface later on down the road for your podcast. So hope that helped. It was helpful and I hope that makes sense. Um, if if I kind of confused that or made it <laughs> confusing for you, please leave any follow-up questions. Love to take a look at those. Thank you, Daniel, for that question. Next one is from Naeem. Uh, he says, I attended some lectures at the uni where I work. The room that the lectures are delivered in has an amplifier connected to the speaker system. Currently, the speaker uses a cheap clip-on mic that is connected directly into the amp by six and one quarter pin connector of very poor quality. The room can hold about 50 people. Is there any mic, radio or otherwise that you would recommend? Well, Naeem, I'm, uh, I'm, I apologize. I don't know. I'm not familiar with a six and one quarter pin connector. If you have a, if you could take a picture of that, maybe with your phone or some other means and send it to me, I'd love to know what that is. And then perhaps we can get some recommendations for you. So thank you for that question. And hopefully you're able to follow up and we can get an answer for you. Next one from Nathan Cooper. I, Curtis, my friend and I are huge fans of your channel. Recently enrolled in your audio class. Really excited to get started. My question, we recently filmed a 45-minute short film. We have a Rode NTG 4 Plus and the audio is all right. We want to experiment with ADR. Could you make a movie talking about how to do ADR and when you should ADR the whole project or just parts of it and how that works? Thanks. Um, first of all, Nathan, I have to confess, I am not an ADR expert. I have never formally done ADR. I've read about it. I have talked to people who have done it. <laughs> um, I know a couple of things about it. So let me tell you what I do know. And then perhaps at some point in the future, as I get more experience with it, I will make an episode. So I apologize. I don't have anything for you right now. 
Um, this is what I know at a very high level, first of all. Um, ADR is expensive, and I mean that both in terms of currency or in terms of time, or both. So if you're doing a short film and it's just a passion project, it's going to be expensive in terms of time. It takes a lot of time to do it properly. And if you're paying actors or anything like that, it's going to cost you more money because you're going to have to bring them into the studio and re-record. Again, if it's just a passion project and you have all the time in the world, then yeah, you can do it. You're going to have to... Um, it's going to take some experimentation and some work to get it done right. But what I would do to practice is I would film yourself and then I would practice doing the ADR until you get the technique, the technical parts of the technique down first and then bring your actors back in and do it with them. So that's that's one thought there. Um, ADR is something that in movies they really, really try to avoid because, again, it is very expensive. They have to pay the actors more to come into the studio. Um, it takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of effort. You have to hire an engineer. You have to hire... Um, you know, a variety of different people to come in and do that. So it's best to be avoided. So that kind of hopefully answers your question about whether or not or when you should ADR the whole project or just parts of it. Um, generally for movies, they try not to do, they try to do as little ADR as possible. That's the short answer <laughs> because again, it's expensive and it's, you know, it's, it's cool that it can be done, but it's not usually the funnest thing and it's not usually... Uh, the most cost-effective thing to do. There, that being said, there are cases where you have to do ADR. Um, for example, the movie Life of Pi, I was watching a behind the scenes on that. There was no way they could record production audio on this particular scene they had where a boat is in a storm and sinking. Um, just couldn't do it. So they did have to do some ADR on that. Fortunately, there wasn't a lot of ADR. It was a lot more sound design and sound effects that they did on that. Um, but there are, so I'm just here saying, I guess, in short, there are cases where you have to do ADR. So that, that's generally the approach is do it only where you have to use the production audio every, you know, the rest of the time. So that's the first thought. Um, in terms of how it's done, I think the most popular technique based on what I've heard from other people I've talked to who have done it is looping is, a, is something that they like to do. And the way that looping works is that the actor comes in you put headphones on them you have the screen that plays back the scene and you let it run through a few times so that they can kind of refresh themselves on exactly what they said and how they said it and the inflections they used um, and then you kind of keep loop you loop through that several times and have them do multiple takes and then once you get into post you can take those and choose the one that seems to fit the best in terms of its inflection its performance you know how well did they actually express what was supposed to be expressed in that scene so on and so forth. So that's the general idea. There are a lot of technicalities to it. And those are the things that I don't know because I haven't done it. So there's a high level, Nathan. I think it's a great question. And I promise someday when I have some experience with it, I'll come back and tell you more about it. So um, one thing I would recommend, one of the, the sources that I listened to that um, was pretty helpful, and they actually did a demonstration of how looping works for ADR, um, is a course that was put out by MZ. And I realize this, this one costs money. I don't know how much it costs now. I attended live, and it was a $300 course. I think it's less expensive if you buy it online. But anyway, that's one source. There are probably lots of others as well. Um, but that one was actually pretty interesting. It was a, probably about a 30-minute segment where he showed us how to do that, a guy by the name of Mark Lewis, and um, actually did a demonstration on how he did it. I think in his case, he used Adobe Audition. You could use other applications as well. Um, but there's an overview of ADR. Thanks for that question. Next up, uh, James Russell. Hi, Curtis. Great informative videos. Fantastic information. Two short questions. First, do you have a preference for XLR cables? And second, let's do first. Uh, so do I have a preference for XLR cables? Yes, I like XLR cables. I think what you're asking is the brand. Um, sorry, I don't mean to be a smart aleck about that. But the, yes, there are a few brands that I've used. Let me just show you a couple of things to consider. We're going to come back to that one. In terms of what the um, a lot of the professional mixers are using out there, there are a couple things. Number one, a lot of them, well, some of them at least, I don't know what percentage of them, some of them make their own custom cables. They are actually engineers. They know how to solder. They know how to source the parts for, for these. They use high-quality cables and good-quality connectors. They solder them and put them together themselves. And um, that is one thing they do. A uh, brand that is respected amongst the professional mixers, 
generally is a company called Remote Audio. And here at True Audio, you can see they're not cheap, um, but this is a good quality cable, 25-foot cable for $45 roughly U.S. Um, and again, it's, a, it's the company, the brand name is Remote Audio. I am currently using some custom-made cables that a friend of mine made for me that um, I paid him. He's a professional DJ, and uh, he had experience making the cables, and I've had a good experience with those. Um, I have also purchased in the past cables from a company called Sweetwater here in the U.S. Um, and if you go to their website, sweetwater.com, they have this little cable finder here. You click on that. Um, you go back to step one. What you do is you tell it the type of connections you want. So, for example, we want a microphone cable. We want XLR female on one side, XLR male on the other side, and then it shows you all the options out there. The one company that they um, sell... Well, one of the companies they sell, uh, brands they sell, is Proco. I've had a pretty good experience with Proco and Fast. That was one of my first XLR cables, and it lasted me. For, it was a 25-foot cable with, um, they have Nutric connectors. That's a brand that makes um, these high-quality connectors, and they, they, I've always had great luck with Nutric connectors. Um, that cable lasted me for nearly 10 years before I finally, I think I, um, this little part here, let's see if we can pull that up. This little part right here, you're probably not seeing that, but this part here um, actually broke off. I don't know how that happened, <laughs> but after 10 years use, I couldn't really be disappointed. It actually held up very well. So that's another option. Um, I have a Mogami cable as well. Mogami is a, um, in fact, if we come back here, just so you can see how it's spelled. Mogami is actually a Japanese uh, brand. They also use Nutric connectors. These are um, very well respected, but I think they're mainly used in studios, not used as much by field mixers. I have, a, I have one as well. It's a, it's a kind of a smaller gauge cable, so I usually just keep that in my studio. I don't use that out in the field, um, but they, they're a very well respected brand as well. You can see here in the case of a, if we were looking at a 25 foot cable is $70 US. So you pay a lot of money for that. They are great cables. Um, but again, I don't usually use those out in the field just because they seem a little bit more delicate. Um, but they do do a great job. My brother's used them on stage and he says they are, they're definitely worth the investment on stage because when you have all those cables out and you've got to put on a show, um, you don't have time to figure those issues out if you're getting, getting any sort of interference or any sort of funky stuff. So, um, or loose connections and things of that nature. So those are some thoughts on cables. So I think it's short. I guess I'm saying there are lots of good options out there. Um, I have I have bought um, I bought one from Guitar Center once too when I was kind of desperate. I needed a cable quickly. Um, and that one worked fi fine too. It was, I think the brand name was Livewire. It's okay. Um, and I've used it a little bit here and there and it's been fine. So uh, I guess the short answer is I don't have one ultimate brand to recommend but if you do want the ultimate and you don't mind paying the extra money remote audio probably will not let you down second question i always notice you use adobe audition for your sound processing is that in your opinion the best program out there absolutely positively not the best program out there it's a great program um, and i like to use it for education purposes and i like to use it for another reason education purposes i like it because it has the waveform editor which makes it very easy to teach and to visually show what's happening to the waveform when you process it. So for that reason, I really like it. I also like to use it because a lot of my audience are actually enthusiast filmmakers and a lot of them have Adobe Creative Cloud and Audition comes with Creative Cloud. So um, that's another reason I use it. However, again, it's not, it's not, I'm not using it because I think it's the best. I'm using it because it's reason, it's, it's functional. It has pretty much everything you need to get started in terms of plugins. You can do fairly simple editing jobs in it all the way up to, you know, actually mixing full films, you know, with lots of dialogue tracks, with a whole bunch of effects tracks and music tracks. It can handle that. Generally, I have had some issues if they're getting a little bit unstable. Um, I was once mixing a film that had probably about... 30 tracks, which is not a big film. You know, a lot of the major motion pictures have more than that, but this one had probably about 30 tracks plus, you know, some mixed buses. And it started to get a little bit flaky. It crashed a few times. I haven't had that problem when I'm doing simple things like, you know, um, just a simple YouTube video that has a dialogue track, a sound effects track, and a music track. 
Um, but once you can start getting a lot more tracks, things get a little bit dodgy. Um, there are lots of other great ones out there. Logic Pro is a great one. Um, that's used a little bit for f in the film industry. The biggest one used in the film industry is Pro Tools, made by Avid. And that's just sort of the standard because so many of the different post houses use it. Um, and everybody knows it in the film industry. That one's a little bit more complicated and a little bit more expensive. So that's a trade-off for us that are more sort of semi-pro and enthusiasts. Um, so we can't necessarily afford that. So yeah, they're all comparable. The real reality is, is if they do, you know, 32 or 60 bit, 64 bit processing, they're all kind of the same at some level, you know, and then it just really becomes a, an issue or a question of what works best for you. And are you going to be working with other people where you're going to need to um, save the sessions and send it to somebody else? So that's really what it comes down to. So yeah, Pro Tools is great. Audition is great. Logic Pro 10 is great. Uh, Studio One is great, which has become very, very popular now with a lot of the music production world, at least the home studio recorders, recordists. Um, so there are lots of options out there. I wouldn't say one's any better than the other. Now, you also mentioned RX by Isotope. Um, that is actually a little bit different, and I have it up here. This is not the same as the full digital audio workstations like Pro Tools, Audition, Studio One, Final, um, Apple's version, what is it called? Uh, <laughs> sorry, um, Logic Pro 10. So Isotope is a little, RX is a little different. It is actually more for cleaning your audio. And generally the way you're using this is you're working on a single clip at a time. So you're not mixing a whole bunch of clips together on a film timeline. So this one's a little bit different. This is more sort of a deep dive, cleaning the audio, optimizing the audio and things of that nature. So it's not really comparable to the others from the standpoint that it's not a full digital audio workstation like the others. And you wouldn't use this for your, you would use this to clean audio clips, but I don't think you'd really use it. In fact, I don't know, even know if, I don't think there's a multi-track view in it. So you can't mix multiple tracks together. So hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. And I think that was the question you had. Thanks for that, Jim. Next up, a question from Greg Palmer. Actually, several questions. This one will take a while. Um, Greg, these are all really good. Thank you for this. So first, you just did a shoot in a parking garage, horrible reverb and street noise. I used a Sennheiser MKH-50, super cardioid mic, and a Senken Cos 11D lavaliers hiding under the actor's shirts. The recording had terrible reverb and street noise on both lavs and boom. Lavs were better, but still had considerable reverb. I'm just wondering if I could have done something else to minimize the reverb and street noise. The director of photography thought a shotgun with a narrower pickup pattern would have been a better choice, but I've always heard to stay away from an interference pattern shotgun when in a room with reverb. What would be your approach given a shoot in a parking garage with extreme reverb? Um, those are, that's a tricky situation. And I agree generally that avoiding a um, shotgun microphone that has an interference tube design in a reverberant room is generally a good idea. However, just yesterday I was working on a production where one of my friends, uh, Scott Vanderbilt, was the sound mixer, and he actually used a Sheps CMIT 5U, which is a shotgun microphone, inside of a large um, basketball arena, so a sports arena. And um, he got what I would consider a pretty good recording with that. And there was lots of loud music and there was all sorts of noise. And um, overall, he got a pretty pretty good recording. So he also had Sankin Cost 11D lavalier microphones. And based on listening back to, the, to both of them, we're probably going to use the boom um, for that piece. And the boom actually sounds pretty good. So it's not a hard and fast rule. What you need to be aware of, however, is that when the sound source gets off axis... Um, when uh, sorry, when the dialogue that you're recording gets off axis and the reverb comes back very quickly if you're very close to a wall, um, that's when you can start to get those phase issues and comb filtering issues, particularly when the talent starts to go off axis because then the sound is going to start coming into the interference tube about the same time it's coming in the front of the mic and that's where you get the really kind of heavy comb filtering. So if you can keep the actors on axis the whole time, you may get a pretty good result. Um, so, so don't write that off as the, you know, an absolute hard rule that you have to follow all the time. So that's one consideration. Number two, I probably <laughs> would have chosen uh, more of a 
super cardioid type pickup pattern. And yes, there will still be reverberation. And yes, there will still be um, road noise. Now, one question you have to ask yourself is, does the piece, you have to be too, you have to be careful too about what, while eliminating or reducing road noise and reverberation is usually desirable. You also don't want to go to the extreme where there's none of that, especially if they're filming in a place where naturally we would expect to hear some of that. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind as well, that you don't necessarily want to remove all of it because then it will seem unnatural because then it will sound like, hey, they don't sound like they're in a parking garage so that you can s sort of start to create some, um, you know, in, in the viewer's eyes and, and experience it may not seem realistic because suddenly it's it seems out of place. So that's a, just a consideration to keep in mind. However, one thing I would do is, and I think this is something that very few of us do because it's difficult, is sound blankets is something you can do. You can put them behind the camera or off to the, you know, to the side of the camera, out of the frame, and that can do a lot. And you don't need a lot of them necessarily. Um, if you're booming from above, putting one on the ground can make a big, big difference. Can you explain all the different modes of time code on the Zoom F8? Internal free run, internal record run, external, external auto record. I'm a little confused. Is time code actually recorded in the WAV file? Yes, it is recorded in the WAV file. And what are all these different modes? Well, let me show you. So yes, it is, it's, it, it's baked into the WAV file. So that's what time code does so that when it comes time to sync it up with the camera, the camera will also have time code baked into it. And it's very easy for the computer to just to say, okay, where's the start time here, start time here, let's line those up, sync them, and you're off and on your way to editing. Or if you're doing it, you know, after the edit's already been done, you can sync it up that way as well. So that's that, it, yes, it is recorded in the WAV file. Um, someone had corrected me in the past and said that it's only the start time that's recorded in the WAV file. That may be, I don't know. I don't think that's the case because uh, when I sync with Tentacle Sync, the software that comes with Tentacle Sync, um, it actually gives you the option of syncing at the start of the file, the middle of the file, or the end of the file. So I think it's actually recorded through the entire thing. Anyway, I'm not sure on that, but it is baked into the WAV file in some fashion. Secondly, what about all these different types of time code? One resource that's worth looking at, this is uh, soundrolling.com. This is a um, mixer in, based in London, whose name is Matt Price. He has a pretty significant social media presence and um, he interviews a lot of professional sound mixers. Pretty interesting. He has a run through of the different types of time code. And let me just run you through kind of the main ones here. Record run is, um, well, first of all, let me say this. In my experience, we generally use free run or 24 hour free run. Um, and you have a, you know, there are different ways you can do it. You can be tethered to the camera so that the audio is syncing directly to the camera and time code is kind of irrelevant at that point, potentially, if that's how they want to record it. Um, free run and 24 hour free run are kind of the same. They're pretty much the same thing. The difference is that 20 hour uh, free run or 24 hour run is pretty much like free one, except it's synced to the time of day. So, um, you know, midnight is zero, 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 and it's synced to the time of day. And then you also still have to have a time code generator for both the mixer and for the camera, so you can sync them up. And what this, what this does, just like free run, is um, that clock keeps running even when you're not recording, if that makes sense. So when you start recording, the clock has already been running and it's and it starts baking it into the file both on the camera and the audio recorder at the time you happen to start recording. So that's what free run is. This is typically what I use, free run. So I use my Sound Devices 633 as the time code generator of the main clock or the master clock. Um, I sync to it a little tentacle sync time code generator and then I hook that up to my camera so that that little tentacle sync has the same time that the Sound Devices has and the sound devices was used as the master clock, so it was the one that set the time. Um, hook that up to my camera, and what happens is they're all, they're both continually running. Until I turn them off, they're both running at the same time. And then whenever I happen to start recording, they're already running, and they record that into the camera file and to the audio file. And then in post, you can sync them up. So that's what free run is, and 24-hour free run. 
record run is a little bit different. Record run means that the recorder, and I'm just going to read straight here from Matt's definition, which I think was a good one. This means your recorder will send time code when you are recording and otherwise stop time code until you start recording again. So um, it usually starts at 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. So a, a 30 second recording and a 45 second recording will mean your time code for the next file will start at 115. So that's how that works. Um, I have never used that mode and um, that's all I know about it. <laughs> the next one you ask, ask about is external time code. So this is a mode where the time code is being read from an external source. So if, for example, you had your field mixer, like say, for example, my sound device is 633, connected directly to the camera, the sound devices would be feeding the time code to the camera. And so every time you press, press record on each of those, it would already have the time which was being generated by the sound devices mixer and uh, record that to the to the camera file and to the uh, file on the mixer. In those cases, it's it's I believe it's acting the same as um, free run. It's um, because it's just always running on the on the mixer and it's being sent to the camera. So the camera just takes whatever it's being given through its time code import, and that's how that works. The final one that we'll talk about here today is the external time code auto record. The difference on this one is that it also sends control signals so that when you start recording on the camera, it also sends a signal to the mixer or vice versa to start recording at the exact same time. So it kind of automates that process a little bit and gets both of them going at the same time. I have seen this on um, the one of the mixers that we reviewed late last year was this, the uh, Tascam DR701D. It actually does this via HDMI, which is a little bit different. Um, so the control signals all come over the HDMI and it's able to start and stop them at the same time. So anyway, I'll put the link for this in the uh, description below so you can come and take a closer look at that. And hopefully that kind of answers some of your questions. Thinking about getting, this is the next question. I'm thinking about getting a new, a little longer boom pole. My current pole is the standard nine foot with an internal coil cable. And I find it to be a little short. I would agree. I think that um, for a lot of the blocking that we have in in a lot of cases, you're, mine is a 12 foot and I find that to be pretty much right on. I've never not been able to reach something I needed to reach. Um, so that's worked out nicely for me. I've also found that when the boom is fully extended, I can get a slapping of the coil with quick movements of the pole. I was wondering if a pole that has a straight internal cable would be a better choice and may not be as susceptible to cable slapping what are your thoughts on internal coil, internal straight cable, or maybe external cable? Well, I've done two of those. I have my current pole, which is a KTEC, has an internal coiled cable. Um, and that works nicely. And yes, if you move the pole very quickly, you will get a slapping sound of the cable hitting the inside of the pole. And it's carbon fiber, so it, um, it resonates. It makes a sound, and that can transfer into the microphone. Um, you can also get poles with internal straight cables. Um, I think those are generally easier to, I guess the downside of the coiled cable is that over time as you extend and retract your pole, things can get twisted up pretty well inside. And so that's, some people don't like coiled, internal coiled cables for that reason. Um, so that's potential downside. If you're careful, I don't think it's a problem. And a lot of them, you can actually take the head of the boom pole off professional cables, the professional poles at least, and you can untangle them and put them back in. So that's one consideration. Internal straight cables are nice from the standpoint that they generally don't get all twisted up. Um, they do still make noise. So if you move quickly on that boom pole, it's still gonna make noise. It's gonna have the same issue where it's gonna slap against the side. Um, the advantage is, of course, you don't get tangled and you can, I believe, in a lot of cases, remove the cable pretty easily. So that's internal. And then finally, external cable, I've done that where you just sort of wrap the cable around the outside. The nice thing about that is that you're not gonna get that slapping noise. The bad thing about that is that you've constantly gotta be managing that. And when you're booming and mixing, you have a lot of other things going on already anyway. So the downside to that is it's just one more thing to, to make sure that you're wrapping the cable so it's not going to slap against the pole. So there are pluses and minuses to each of them. Um, my main question would be that, um, I guess if you're in a situation where you have to cue that quickly, that is move between actors with your pole that quickly, um, you know, there, there's an art to it. You've got to, 
you've got to get to the point where you can do it smoothly. You're also, when you're cueing, you're also twisting the pole to cue the microphone between actors in addition to moving it. So it becomes a very fluid kind of thing that you have to develop a skill for. And that can help reduce a lot of that slapping. If you're moving, you know, in a jerky fashion, that's when you're going to get the slapping. So you've got to learn how to finesse it a little bit more. At least that's what I've seen amongst the good boom operators that I've seen, where they learn to to really finesse it so that they don't get that slapping noise. Otherwise, you could experiment with an external cable and see if that works for you. What a lot of people do is also to help maintain, the, keep the cable tightly coiled around the pole. They will use those little hair ties that... Um, I don't see a lot of women using them now today or girls using them today, but they have the kind of plastic balls on both sides and you can wrap them around and just use those to kind of hold the cable in place so it doesn't end up kind of coming away from the pole and then slapping against it when you move. So those are some considerations. I think a lot of it is really technique and kind of practicing your technique and getting it so that you're you're twisting to get the cueing, to get the microphone um, pointed in the right direction, and at the same time you're using more finesse. Um, so those are some considerations there. But if you're in a situation where you just, you have to cue really fast, maybe using the external cable is the answer for you. All right. And then Greg's final question, which is actually in two pieces. Just this week purchased a new Genheiser, sorry, <laughs> Sennheiser G3 wireless system from B&H. No sooner had I hit buy from B&H that I received an email from B&H telling me that my brand new $600 G3 could be returned into Sennheiser for a $100 voucher because the Federal Communications Commission, that's in the U.S. here, and who oversees all of the wireless use amongst other things, is auctioning off the frequencies that this particular wireless system uses. I said, what the heck? How can this make sense? What is going on with wireless system frequencies? I'm wondering if I just bought a turd and whether my current systems are all turning into turds. Any insight? Yes. Um, I first of all get that thing returned to ASAP. BNH should take it back. Um, yes, the FCC is auctioning off frequencies that will that are currently available for use for wireless um, microphone systems like the Sennheiser G3 in particular blocks. That's the thing you have to understand that, that everyone needs to understand. If you're going to buy an analog wireless system, it will be transmitting in a particular block, and you can buy. The same system, the Sennheiser G3, for example, you can buy it in that's so that it's, you know, built for specific frequencies, and that's just how they do it. Um, and you really, what you need to do is kind of find out in your particular locale which frequencies are probably best for you to use, and which are allowed to be used. So you'll want to talk to someone in the area if you can that has experience with that. If there's a rental house, a broadcast rental house in your local area. I would definitely, definitely talk to them and get their input. Um, let me just scroll down to the follow-up from Greg here. He does a little bit more research. Uh, I found a couple of source documents. I know the FCC had taken back the 700 megahertz band some time ago, but now it looks like they are taking back everything above 566 megahertz, which I understand to be the case as well, which means products by Sennheiser, that Sennheiser sells today as Block B and G may become useless. In fact, I would say will become useless within a period of time, within the next couple of years or a year. I really was not aware that the FCC considers all these to be unlicensed transmitters. I'm wondering, are there licensed wireless microphone systems? Seems strange to me that Sennheiser is still selling products in the U.S. for bands that are about to be taken back by the FCC. Yeah, I, I don't know why Sennheiser and the retailers are doing that, but I suspect it's because there are professionals that still need to use those until they can upgrade maybe to... Um, one of the newer technologies that use narrower bands or transmit over multiple bands at the same time, and they have the ability to figure out which one to use, which one is the best signal based on interference that it's receiving. So there's a lot going on there. I suspect that Sennheiser and the retailers are still selling them because some of those pros have a short-term need. They're not buying it for the long term. They're just buying it for a particular gig um, that has the budget to do that for whatever reason. I that's a guess. I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't think it's a good idea myself. Um, I wish they weren't doing that, but that's the reality. Um, so a couple of things. If you are in the United States and you are looking at wireless systems, I would highly recommend you go to the FCC site and read up on this. It's Yeah, it's pretty dense, um, but you do need to know about it. And I'll put a link to this. This is one of the ones that Greg provided. I will say this, I have not done deep research on this, so I don't know all the ins and outs. I was just talking to my friend Scott about this yesterday. 
Um, but right now I'm using all digital and those are all operating in the 2.4 gigahertz range. So that frequency is set aside for digital wireless transmission. It's shared with Wi-Fi, so there's some risks there. May not be the best thing for in really our radio frequency heavy areas. Um, but I've generally had pretty good luck with it in the areas where I'm shooting, which are generally offices for corporate videos. Um, so I'll, I'll be looking into this in the future, but in the meantime, yeah, I would I would highly recommend you get that return to B&H, get your money back and take a step back, do a little bit more research. And, you know, B&H actually has some good resources if you talk to the sales staff there. I think they have some people on staff there that can actually help you kind of figure, kind of show you the ropes and, and decide which blocks you need to buy when you're buying your wireless system. So hopefully that's helpful. Um, that is a big topic, and we will we will definitely re revisit that again in the future. So hope those were helpful for you today. That is the end of our session for today. Get out there and make some great recordings. Talk to you soon.